Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, thousands of Israelis gather in Tel Aviv to show their support for Prime Minister Netanyahu. An incredible and powerful clothing exhibit gains international attention. And stick around for some happy holiday wishes with Israel's Ethiopian community. Thousands of the Prime Minister's supporters are making their voices heard now as they flood the Tel Aviv streets for a pro-Netanyahu rally Tuesday night. Indictments have been announced against Netanyahu in three different criminal cases, resulting in counts of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. But mimicking Netanyahu's own rhetoric, protesters say that it's the prosecutors that should be prosecuted for attempting to overthrow the nation's leader in what they're calling an ugly coup. In fact, demonstrators could be seen holding signs reading Investigate the Investigators while calling for the state top, state's top attorney, Shai Nitzan, to be interrogated. All these inquiries, which take four years, were supported by the TV, net, the TV networks, and they really influenced the results of the elections. We protest against it, and we think that uh, judicial and uh, law enforcement should not interfere in politics. Then even though most members of Netanyahu's Likud party had abstained from the event, Likud MK and Culture Minister Miri Regev, amongst others, was in attendance to deliver a gripping address. לא הפרשנים, לא הטוקביקיסטים, לא ארגני השמאל וגם לא הכסף של האיחוד האירופאי, רק שופטים. וכמובן, מעל כולם, אזרחי מדינת ישראל. For Netanyahu's part though, he's been saying that while he deeply respects the justice system in Israel, you'd have to be blind not to see that something bad is happening to police investigators and prosecutors. Also, he's reiterating his belief that the police force is attempting to a coup to get him out of his seat. About 5,000 protesters were reported to have attended the Tel, the Tel Aviv rally in central Rabin Square. And joining us now for more on the pro-Netanyahu rally Tuesday night, please welcome Davidi Hermelin, the president of the International Center for Public Diplomacy in Israel. Davidi, thank you so much. It's good to have you back. Thank you. Uh, now, thousands of people arrived in Tel Aviv last night. Why, why do you think that they're so sure uh, in, in their support for Netanyahu, even now after indictments have been uh, announced? Because as long as we're going on with this uh, uh, process, we can see how ridiculous the charges are and how many bad things were uh, done by the police and by the attorneys during this process. And the bad thing is, the worst thing, is that all of these wrong uh, doings are influencing the politics of Israel uh, uh, itself, while the law in Israel says that uh, both things should, uh, uh, be, uh, should be handled simultaneously without disturbing each other. Mm. And uh, I'm very sad to say that uh, Blue and White Party, they already assume like Netanyahu is guilty, that's why they refuse to establish a unity government with him. Although the law says very specifically that in case like that, we should wait and see until there is a verdict by the Supreme Court, which you cannot apply against it anymore. So well, I think I think in general you have you know a presumption of innocence in most Western yes, countries. Yes, but here it's not just the right of the person. Here is the right of the public not to interfere. That no one will interfere. Uh, uh, the, cho the democratic choice of the public by mistakes or by uh, bad ve behaviors by purpose. So mm. even if we assume, and I don't really think that there are mistakes here, I do believe that there is a cue here, but even if we believe that all those mistakes in the investigation and in the uh, legal uh, process, uh, or, uh, no one really wants to do bad things. And Even it's, if you it's think that they had good intentions, right? Yes, the law says, this is why the law exists, 
to let the politics continue until the court will say its final war. All right, well, now let's talk about a little bit uh, the, the Likud primaries that, you know, haven't really been scheduled, but Netanyahu said that they're going to have it. Uh, but right now he's polling pretty well. He's, he's still in the lead of the Likud primary polls. Uh, but you're mentioning again that, you know, opponents on the left are saying, are assuming that he's guilty. Why do you think that there are people within his own party who are, who are trying to take him on in the primaries right now? Well, according to what uh, uh, Mr. Gidon Saar says, he wants to guarantee that the Likud will stay in uh, power, and it's not possible. So you possible don't think it's personal? You don't think it's about the indictments? I, you think it's more just see, kind of maybe a power grab or just what's best for the party? Since I have political, uh, uh, not official, but uh, you know, I'm a member of the Central Committee of the party, I don't want to criticize uh, uh, personally uh, anyone. I just say I just want to say about the, the the topic itself that we as party, at least the majority as I believe, if we truly believe that we cannot uh, take our head uh, uh, down by ourselves, and uh, we, that we should not surround this uh, queue, so uh, we cannot uh, volunteer to change our leader because. The result will be that every time when someone uh, in, the, uh, in those authorities wouldn't like the reforms that we would like to do in the system, they will find charges and will make a revolution again. And that's how it should mm. be called. This is, uh, 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 they try, some people, to make a revolution against elected prime minister. And this is unheard, unacceptable and we cannot accept it, and we cannot volunteer by ourselves to surround. All right, well, Davidi, uh, you know, we've given us a lot to think about, of course. Uh, this is an ongoing situation. I hope you can come back and uh, give us some more updates when there are some. Thank you. One again. thing is important before final we finish. Comment, final comment. Never cross the red line of violence. Everything should be with respect to any other person. I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. All right, reports of explosions are again crossing southern Israel overnight as the IDF confirms striking multiple Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip in retaliation for resumed rocket fire. Reports of explosions are again crossing southern Israel overnight as the IDF confirms striking multiple Hamas targets in the Gaza Strip in retaliation for resumed rocket fire. Two rockets are reported to have been launched in conjunction with the Palestinians' Day of Rage Tuesday evening, and one was shot down by the Iron Dome while the other fell into an open field. But in response, regardless of the lack of damages, Israel hit a number of Hamas sites, including one that was used for the production of arms. And just a few hours later, the IDF reports carrying out a second wave of attacks, including against an underground facility in the northern Gaza Strip. Addressing the attacks, Prime Minister Netanyahu was saying that if terrorists in Gaza think they can raise their heads after Operation Black Belt, they're mistaken. Similarly, Defense Minister Naftali Bennett says that even a rocket that doesn't hit will be judged in the same way as one that does, adding, those that fire will suffer blows. Meanwhile, thousands of Palestinians across sensitive points in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, were also taking part in the so-called Day of Rage by clashing with police, throwing stones and firebombs, and rioting. In fact, schools and public offices were all closed, and nearly 2,000 people gathered in Ramallah alone, where they were setting fire to effigies of United States President Trump, as well as to Israeli and U.S. flags. The Palestinians are marking the Day of Rage in response to the United States' recent policy shift regarding settlements in Judea and Samaria. And the IDF, on the other hand, prepared for the scheduled clashes by increasing the number of soldiers in the field and by issuing new directives to reduce the risk of resorting to lethal force. 77 Palestinians are reported to have suffered light to moderate injuries. All right, now Tuesday this week sadly marked the passing of a very prominent figure in the Israeli military, Yossi Lavok. And here to tell us a little bit more about him is our very own Nitni Manson. Nitni, all right, who is, who is Yossi Lavok? So I have to say, I'm really sad about this man's passing. Um, he is basically the father of the Oketz canine unit in the IDF. Wow, and the, you were actually in that unit. I right? was, so I kind of feel a personal connection to him. <laughs> so it's, it's sad to see him go, but I'm, I'm so impressed with his legacy that he's left behind. All right, well, so, so let's kind of tell us a little bit about that. Like, what does the Oketz unit really do, and how did it come about? Okay, so the Oketz unit um, is, it's the canine unit, so it's the soldiers working with dogs, okay. um, and they do everything from um, <laughs> running on treadmills. Uh -huh. <laughs> they do everything from attack dogs, search and rescue, um, working with hostage situations. 
So they do a ton of things, and this connection that soldiers have with the dogs, it's just, it's a beautiful unit. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, mm. And the beginnings of the unit are actually really interesting. Sure. Um, he, Yossi, was a student kind of of these ideas of a professor who actually came from Austria All right. um, and ran away from Germany because she didn't want to collaborate with the Nazis. I like her already. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And he really believed that dogs could help in the military. Sure. Um, after the Holocaust, of course, there were a ton of Jews here in Israel. Um, and so there was kind of a taboo. They started off using dogs in the military, but it made a lot of people really uncomfortable mm. um, after having been in camps. Chased and by dogs, maybe. Yeah, yeah, the Nazis confusing. used sure. German shepherds. Of course. Um, so in Israel, they kind of fell out of use in the military. And then in the early 70s, there were a lot of terror attacks happening, a lot of hostage situations. And Yossi said, you know what? I really think that dogs could help here. I think that they could be a really good alternate, like, solution for our problem. So he went to the army brass and said, you guys, we need to do this. He brought it on. They ended up starting the Okets unit in 1974. Um, and they have been in use ever since. In the beginning, it was, they're so cute with their soldiers. <laughs> in the beginning, it was very secret. It was top secret. It wasn't wow. until 1988, actually, that they came out and said, we actually are using dogs. We're using them in, wow. in um, certain situations. And that was after um, something happened in Lebanon that they kind of had to be like, yes, we did use dogs here. Oh, wow. And now Yossi just passed away. How old was he, by the way? He was 81. Okay. 81. So... Not too young, but also not, not too not young, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you live me and Okets. There you are in the Okets <laughs> unit. Yeah. All right. Well, this is incredible. I love that that we have this kind of unit and this sort of uh, history here. Yeah. Nidhi, thank you so much for sharing it with My us. My pleasure. In other news, a whole fleet of helicopters has been grounded, and over a dozen IDF soldiers are now catching their breaths after narrowly avoiding a tragedy overnight. Senior defense officials are today praising IAF pilots for their incredibly quick responses after discovering that their Yasser model helicopter's engine had caught fire Tuesday night. And the aircraft was reportedly en route to a base in southern Israel for a training drill before three teams of firefighters had to be dispatched to tackle the flames. But the pilots are reported to have noticed the fire and landed the chopper in just under a minute, saving all 14 soldiers on board before the aircraft was completely destroyed. And now a full investigation into the cause of the blaze is underway, but for now the military says the engine fire resulted from technical malfunction and human error. And until further notice, the whole fleet of Yasser copters, aka Sikorsky CH-53C stallions, will be grounded. That said though, many in the IDF believe that the Yasser should be retired for good anyway, as in spite of restorations and upgrades, they're roughly 50 years old. Also in 2010, another of the IDF's Yasser heavy transport copters crashed during an international drill, killing five of the IDF soldiers on board. Moving on, Israeli cyber firm NSO Group is now making headlines again as the controversial company is suing Facebook and its subsidiary WhatsApp. NSO is accusing the social media giant of collective punishment for blocking private accounts belonging to NSO employees after Facebook was suing NSO. And joining us now with more is Amir Karmi, CTO of Israeli information security company Asset Israel. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having uh, me. Now, Thank you. Okay, so why, why do you think that this action was taken against NSO, you know, do, would you agree even that it's maybe collective punishment? It is sort of a collective uh, punishment. I think uh, that uh, these sort of cases have been repeated uh, in the last couple of years, and I think these uh, major corporations are trying to find ways to uh, uh, mitigate these uh, uh, cases, although I think this kind of collective punishment is not really going to achieve anything. To, you know, playing devil's advocate, again, you know, if Facebook and WhatsApp, for whatever reason, they're suing NSO, uh, you know, for breach of for breach of their protocols, uh, and that's why they said that they're blocking their accounts as well. But again, you know, what account? Wh why why block individual accounts? Is that maybe because of the nature of NSO? And the yeah, employees are working? I, I agree that it's a strange uh, uh, way of uh, action. Um, well, basically, you have to get back to the to the reason, to the core reason of this uh, mm -hmm. happening which is uh, NSO as a company which sells uh, cyber surveillance uh, uh, software to different re regimes around the world. Mm -hmm. And this uh, software, uh, in this case, they actually uh, exploited a vulnerability in the WhatsApp uh, protocol. 
and they use the WhatsApp uh, 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 voice over IP calls, meaning the, the voice calls that you can make through WhatsApp sure. uh, over the internet uh, in order to infect uh, uh, mobile devices, both uh, iPhones and Android devices, of these targets. And these targets are not always uh, what they're supposedly should be. Well, so um, that's it. You know, Facebook is saying yeah. that NSO abused their policies, their their user policies by you know by uh, using this uh, this hack. Mm -hmm. uh, NSO is saying you know, regardless of what you say, we're only helping to fight crime. Yeah, either crime or uh, terrorism. That that's the 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 let's say that's their uh, uh, main reasoning for uh, supplying this service. Whereas uh, when they sell this service to these uh, regimes that are uh, also trying to uh, interfere with uh, social rights movements, uh, different journalism uh, uh, efforts in order to uh, undermine some of their uh, regime's uh, actions, um, they are targeting not only these uh, uh, criminals or, uh, um, or these terrorists, they're also targeting uh, people that are, well, it's more of a, a Hit and miss, you know. Once this regime is uh, targeting these uh, people that aren't necessarily uh, criminals, uh, then you get into this kind of a dodgy uh, gray area. But so, okay, so what what is NSO's liability? You know, because because I'm sure you know working in cybersecurity and working mm -hmm. uh, in all these really uh, burgeoning fields, these fields mm -hmm. that are really very new, especially when it comes to uh, legislation and the law. Yes. you know, there's a lot of gray area here. So what is, what is NSO's responsibility, in your opinion, uh, with how their product is used or abused, allegedly? Well, I would compare their product to uh, weapons. Uh, once you uh, look at uh, weapons companies that sell their uh, products, their weapons, to different regimes, and uh, they don't necessarily know what these weapons are used for, then uh, they can maybe uh, get uh, some sort of liability off of the, themselves. Yeah. But still, you have to consider the kind of regimes that you're selling these weapons to. And this is an actual weapon. It allows you to uh, put a surveillance on your mobile is device. It, I mean, is it possible that NSO's surveillance technology was you know, sold to a good actor who then gave it to a bad actor? Well, uh, in some cases, these uh, weapons or these uh, uh, um, cyber or uh, spyware, mm -hmm. I would call them, uh, software, um, they can leak the, the, the source code and then sure. these source codes can be sold wow. onto these uh, cyber criminals or wow. other factors. So right, well. as, as in with any weapon, once these weapons sure. get out there, anyone can use them it's to any purpose. To... All right, well, thank you so much, Emil, for, for coming in. Thank you. All right, now a very powerful exhibit commemorating the fight against violence against women is now gaining widespread international attention. Since the start of 2019, 13 women in Israel have been killed by a family member. And in 2018, the number of Israeli women killed in domestic violence hit a whopping 25, leading to powerful demonstrations and calls for urgent action. To honor the women who have been victims of domestic violence, the lobby of the Tel Aviv Municipality Building is now displaying the clothing of 11 women who were killed during the last two decades. The exhibit is called She's Gone. And one of the outfits on display even includes the pink dress that famous model and actress Anat Eli Melech wore on screen the day before she was murdered by her own boyfriend in 1997. It was a case that shook the country. The only information provided next to the clothes on display at the exhibit are the first names, dates of murder, murder weapon, and sentence given to the murderer, which is often argued to be too lax. But despite the limited info on each victim, the artist behind the exhibit says she spent time building trust with family members before they donated the clothes, especially as some families gave up garments that may have been the last thing left from a daughter or sister. The exhibit has also been on display at the president's home in Jerusalem and other government ministries. And soon it'll travel to Berlin and New York, where it will appear at the UN headquarters in honor of the International Day for the Fight Against Violence Against Women. It is thought that the exhibit might even be chosen by the International Bodies Women's Rights Agency as one of 2020's most interesting projects. 
And up now we have ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh here with the Entertainment Rundown. Emmanuel? Hey Aaron, so the first story I have for you is actually one that makes me so unbelievably happy because one of my favorite comedians of all time, Tiffany Haddish, is learning Hebrew and is studying to be bat mitzvahed. For those who don't know, Haddish, Haddish has starred in blockbuster movies like Girls Trip and The Secret Life of Pets 2, and actually spent over a decade as what she calls an energy producer at hundreds of bar and bat mitzvahs. All right, so this is epic. Like, I, I heard a little bit about, you know, Haddish's past in entertainment uh, and in entertaining bar mitzvahs, yes. but like, how does, how does that lead her to actually going through one herself? Right, so while she was working at all of the bar mitzvah events, Haddish didn't know she had any Jewish heritage until she met her biological father at the age of 27, where he told her that he was an Eritrean Jew wow. and that she is Jewish. She said in an interview published Friday that she started, she started to learn more about the Torah and that she could really relate to it. After she met her father, she did her 23andMe and it said she um, was Jewish. She said she, quote, cl she claims it, she owns it now. I was Exciting for her. That's amazing. Like that's such a cool story I know, too. I like, know. Uh, but so when's the big event? All right. So she's going to be celebrating with a ceremony on, in Los Angeles on her 40th birthday, December 3rd. And on the same day, she's actually set to release a new Netflix stand-up special titled Black Mitzvah. I can't explain to you how excited I am for this. But before, take a look at the clip of this trailer. It's my mitzvah. I'm here to teach. I, I'm, I'm blown away. <laughs> I know. Like this is gonna be amazing. I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, all right, what's next though? What's, right. You have yes. more entertainment news. So up next, two sophomore albums from Israeli music groups have received nominations for the upcoming 62nd annual Grammy Awards. Whoa. The first one being the Anat Cohen Tenant with Israeli jazz clarinet Anat Cohen, which received a nomination in the Best Large Jazz Ensemble Album category for Triple Helix. Exciting, all right. Yeah. Is, uh, is, is this uh, Cohen's first Grammy nomination? No, no, it's actually her third, which is super exciting. But other than a knot, another band, Southern Avenue, which is actually a Memphis based soul, blues, and RB band, which was co founded by Israeli guitarist Ori Naftali, also received a Grammy nomination in the Best Contemporary Blues Album category for Keep On. Wow, such a huge, like, huge congratulations for all these people. Uh, yeah, and, and good luck to them both, obviously, at the Grammys. Emmanuel, thank you so much for the update. Of course. All right, now for those who may not know, today marks the first day of the very happy annual holiday of Sigd. Every year on the 29th of the Hebrew month of Cheshvan, just 50 days after Yom Kippur, the Jews of the Ethiopian community celebrate Sigd. Derived from the Hebrew word skida, meaning prostration, the holiday commemorates the renewal of the covenant between the Jews, God, and the Torah. And it's traditionally celebrated by praying to return to Zion, or the land of Israel, as the holiday originates in the diaspora. Also, Sigd is related to Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, in the idea that one must be introspective and repentant in order to enter the land of Zion. Therefore, Sigd is also traditionally marked by fasting until sundown, but today, as most of the Beta Israel, or Ethiopian Jewish community, already lives in Israel, it's more of a holiday marked by large gatherings in Jerusalem with the Ethiopian Jewish religious leaders, or Kassim, festive meals, and generally catching up with the family and community at large. Also, this is now the 11th year since 2008, when Israel officially designated Sigd to be a national holiday, meaning it's already getting a lot more of the attention it rightly deserves. Prime Minister Netanyahu even reached out to the community with a video message expressing how important the holiday and the Israeli Ethiopians are to the nation, adding that a lot more work on integration and anti-discrimination lies ahead, but that it can and will be done with a united front. <laughs> יהיו גאים במורשתכם, המשיכו לתרום למדינת ישראל. חג סיגד שמח לכולכם, חג שמח לכל עם ישראל. All right, now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be a little chilly with average lows of around 55 or 13 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect mostly sunny skies and a slight drop in temperatures to an average high of 71 or 21 degrees Celsius. And that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. 
For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.